Clark on GB News. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on your telly, radio and online. On today's show, will we ever get a grip on the migrant crisis? And after the interest rate hike and some mortgages on their last legs, are we heading towards a winter of discontent and repossessions? And now, even Tony Blair is calling the latest season of The Crown complete rubbish. But first, here's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you and good afternoon to you. The top stories from the GB newsroom today. Counter-terrorism police say the firebombing of an immigration processing centre in Dover in Kent was motivated by an extreme right-wing terrorist ideology. Officers say evidence, including digital media devices, have been recovered during their investigation. Andrew Leake from High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire is believed to have thrown up to three incendiary devices at the Western Jet Foil site in Kent last weekend. There were no major injuries and the 66-year-old was found dead by police at a petrol station nearby afterwards. And GB News has learned detainees armed with various weapons have caused a disturbance during a power cut at an immigration centre in West London. The Home Office says the incident happened in the early hours of this morning at Harmonsworth Immigration Removal Centre near Heathrow. No one was injured during the incident and the authorities remain on scene. There are more than 600 migrants at Harmonsworth who are being processed for removal from the UK. The UN's chief, Antonio Guterres, says the world is doomed, his words, unless a historic pact is signed between rich and poor countries. His warning comes ahead of the COP27 summit next week. Wealthy nations have already promised to find almost £88 billion a year for poor nations to fund measures to tackle climate change. That was originally meant to be spent in 2020, but is now not expected to come online until 2023. And that news comes as Australia's east coast is dealing with a fourth flood crisis this year. New South Wales has evacuated people from their homes and cleared livestock from land ahead of an expected peak in floodwaters. Flooding has left thousands of people homeless and left agricultural businesses in tatters. Australia and the Pacific nations have announced they want to launch a bid to co-host the 2026 UN Climate Summit. We're back at the international table. Unlike recent COPs where Australia was seen as part of the group which actually was working to stop progress, to get in the way of, the pro of progress, Australia will be a willing and active participant in these discussions. Here, a series of planned rail strikes due to begin today were called off, but the government's warning there could still be disruption. RMT members were due to walk out for three days, but the union says it's secured a pay offer and is now entering talks. The former Assistant General Secretary at the RMT, Steve Headley, though, says members were furious because they had no say in whether or not to call off the action. In a situation where the strike's been called off and the members don't know why, Mm. And the, the, the explanations being given at the minute don't make sense. Intensive negotiations, well, what were they doing before? If there's a deal on the table, let the members have a look at it. Mm. The members will soon say yes or no. 
Now, Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, has criticised activists who he says have pressured major advertisers to stop spending on the platform. The world's richest man defended his decision to sack around half of the company's workforce, saying all staff who'd been laid off had been offered three months' redundancy pay. And amid concerns over disinformation on the site, Musk is adamant the company's commitment to content moderation, as it calls it, has not been compromised. Football fans who are convicted of taking or selling Class A drugs at matches could be banned from future games for up to 10 years. The move will come into force next week. The UK's football policing chief says drugs are seen as one of the main drivers of increased disorder at games. Home Office data shows just over 2,000 football-related arrests were made last season. That's the highest figure since 2013. And lastly, a major cyber attack that targeted the NHS is continuing to affect tens of thousands of patients. It targeted the system used to refer patients for care, including out-of-hours appointments and emergency prescriptions. Well, the iNewspaper has uncovered that three months after that incident, documents are going missing and prescriptions are at risk of being missed. You're up to date on GB News. More news as it happens. Let's get back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain. Here's what's coming up on the show today. The Telegraph are reporting that Albanian drug gangs are using the migrant camps of northern France as a recruitment ground, offering to pay the passage of those prepared to work in the UK drugs industry on arrival. So what's the best way to stop them? We'll find out. An analyst, an analysis even from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation said 120,000 households in the UK, that's the equivalent of 400,000 people, are going to be plunged into poverty when their current mortgage deals end. So we're asking our mass repossessions around the corner. And now even Tony Blair, remember him? He's calling the latest season of The Crown complete rubbish. John Major also attacks Netflix over utterly untrue scenes showing Prince Charles lobbying the Prime Ministers to help him overthrow his mother. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, I'd love to know your thoughts. Do tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. I've got it open here. You can watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of cracking content on our page. Cheers very much. Before all that, I want to talk to you about the hysterical hoo-ha that's taken hold of much of our media and political class, with shrieks of horror revolving around a single word, one word, invasion. For example, Diane Abbott this week implied that Suella Braverman's rhetoric had contributed to the alleged rape of a teenage boy at a hotel housing refugees. According to pockets of our activist class, the use of the word invasion is yet further confirmation of this Brexit back and Tory fascism that seized power in number 10. It's utterly cartoon. With the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, depicted as being anti-migrant. But as many of you capable of applying common sense to the issue, this hysteria over a simple word simply highlights how blatantly out of touch with the public these people are. In a focus group conducted by the pollster JL Partners, a group of swing voters, that's the kind of voters that decide elections, they decided, without a single dissenting voice, that Suella Braverman was correct to describe what's taking place at our southern border as an invasion. Unlike the Twitter-reading political and media class, they believed that the Home Secretary has good ideas and that Britain is full and at capacity, arguing that politicians simply don't get it when it comes to borderless Britain. The focus group raised concerns around access to healthcare and housing, with a new influx of migration coming into the country, and they're right to do so, if you ask me. Every MP, right, kicking off over the use of the word invasion by Suella, ought to be told by the government, this is what I'd do if they put me in charge, they ought to be told by the government that their constituencies are going to receive a load of the 40,000 primarily single men that have arrived over the English Channel this year. 
Let's see if their constituents agree with their virtue signalling MP. I'm sure they would very quickly find that 40,000 people arriving into their community in an unwanted manner is so clearly the definition of an invasion. It's a small army, right? The British Army only comprises of 79,000 regular full-time personnel. So if it's not an invasion, what is it? What do you call it when someone penetrates a nation's border without permission? I'd absolutely love for Labour and others to answer that simple question. If 1,000 people entered your home in one single day without your permission, I'm pretty certain that you'd call it an invasion too. Suella Braverman, though, was heckled by Labour MPs before adding this. She says, let them try. I know that I speak for the decent, law-abiding, patri patriotic majority of British people from every background that want safe and secure borders. And she's right. She's our last hope, right? Labour would be open doors, would be like Swiss cheese. The British people aren't racists, they're realists. That's why they recognise that we simply cannot be the end destination for every economic migrant illegally arriving here. Where are the homes? Where are the GPs? Where are the school places? Can our virtue signal and MPs answer me that? Parliament seems to care more about the accommodation of law-breaking illegal aliens than they do that of law-abiding British nationals who are facing, let's not forget, a mortgage crisis. There's nothing racist about believing that border controls are a good idea for both national security and a law-abiding citizenry. The policing minister, Chris Philp, he said it's a bit of a cheek for people who have entered the UK illegally to then go on to complain about cramped conditions when they get here. He's not wrong. If you illegally enter a country, hopping through Europe to get here, don't expect the red carpet upon arrival. And at a time when the BBC report that Albanian drug gangs are using migrant camps of northern France as a makeshift job agency, offering to pay for the passage of those that are prepared to engage in wanton acts of criminality when they get here, I'm asking you a really simple question. If you don't have border controls, can you really have national security? Can you even have the nation state? I think the answer to those questions is a profound no. And the senior Tory MP, Craig McKinley, he's warned that the Conservatives risk losing dozens of seats at the next general election if they don't start to take the migrant crisis seriously because of the threat of a new UKIP-style party emerging. And folks, judging by the raucous reception that's been rolled out for Nigel Farage on this very issue, on this very channel, I dare say that the Tories and Labour may be reminded of this threat at the ballot box sooner rather than later. Now, as that migrant crisis continues to be one of the most major issues facing Rishi Sunak's fledgling government, with Sunak himself admitting at Prime Minister's questions this week that not enough asylum claims were being processed, Home Secretary Suella Braverman's rhetoric also, as I say, caused a stir when she described it as an invasion. And earlier today, counter-terrorism police revealed that there was a firebombing of an immigration processing centre which was motivated by right-wing terrorist ideology. Well, with me now is Alp Mehmet from Migration Watch and Phil Brewer, a specialist advisor on modern slavery from the Human Trafficking Foundation, joins me down the line. Alp, can the government actually solve this issue, right? If, if I made you Home Secretary tomorrow, wear it in my gift, what would you be doing? What would I be doing? This is cartoon, isn't it? <laughs> Look, first of all, can I just associate myself with everything that you said in your monologue? I, I agree with so much of that. I think that the debate, the furore over this word that was used, this word invasion, I think it is a distraction. What we need to do now is actually acknowledge that, A, it's a problem, that, B, the people of this country don't want it to continue, and, C, actually deal properly with those that arrive here or we pick up and bring here. We've got to deal with them, we've got to hold on to, on to them, deal with them quickly, 
and then, having reached a decision, either return them back to where they came from, France or wherever, or send them to their own country, to Albania or wherever. Unless you do that, you will never send the message that once you get here, it, everything will be fine and you will get here to stay. That's the problem at the moment. OK, so let's, let's put that to Phil, a specialist and advisor on modern slavery. Phil, the democratic extent of, of this problem, with people saying, hang on a minute, I've been voting for almost a generation now. As long as I've been on this planet, Phil, governments have been voted in on a platform of reducing net migration to this country. Do you worry that there's going to be a loss of faith in the ballot box if we don't get serious on this issue? Well, I think absolutely, Darren. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with much of what you've said. At the end of the day, you know, the, the UK public, the majority of the UK public, just want a fair process. And if, they, if that is people arriving in the UK that require protection, then absolutely the UK should provide them with protection. If it's the case of economic migrants that are arriving and fueling sort of criminality, then it's the process that we need to look at rather than, than actually, um, it, it, you know, it, it, to speed it up, as we say. You know, it's not fair on the public to see people arriving um, and, and, and then this delaying process on the flip side, if you arrive seeking sanctuary, it's not right that you wait years and years for your case to be assessed. Then is there, is there a middle ground uh, here where we say you both, you know, you both come at it from different sides of the argument, perhaps, but when we, we are in the scenario where you've got certain areas around the country that are accepting migrant children that have arrived here, and actually children already here can actually access certain schools. These are real world scenarios that we're hearing right now. And the British population watching these scenes are saying, hang on a minute, have we lost our minds? Look, what we mustn't really forget what this problem is all about. There are 40,000 so far this year who've arrived and those 40,000 have every chance of staying here. Until we can change that perception, I'm afraid they will continue to come. It's all very well for people to complain about the fact that it's taking so long, but when you've got this sort of number, if you're going to consider it properly and seriously, it takes time. I don't think it should take anywhere near as long as it does, but nevertheless, we've got to accept that if we're going to have a process in place for people to be considered for asylum or whatever, I'm afraid that our system is such that we've got and we're obliged to take it carefully and take time doing it. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I'll, I want to ask you about the specifics of that word that Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, used, that word invasion. Would you associate yourself with those remarks? But she's describing precisely what's going on. For, for so many years, you would hear people about, I, I don't know, uh, in, in Westminster, just up the road, the number of times I used to see, here we are, invaded by tourists again. You would go to, when I was working at a port, we'd be invaded by students at certain times of the year. It just, it's describing, and it's about time that a politician actually use the right description of what is actually happening. I see no problem with that. Phil, would you associate yourself with the use of the word invasion? Um, pr probably not, Darren. Um, I, I think it's probably extreme. I think it, it sort of provokes... Um, so what word would a, you uh, use, Phil? What word would you use? Well, I, I don't think... I mean, the figures that, you know, speak for themselves. There has been an absolute increase in terms of the number of people arriving in the UK for whatever reason, economically, or seeking or, or seeking help. But the fact is, you know, invasion is, is language that, that just sort of drums up um, sort of, sort of anti-migrant, anti-support in terms of what we're talking Not about. Not to so me, it doesn't, Bill. Uh, 
it may not to you. You know, we, we all have our own choices. Um, but, you know, the fact is I'm not disputing that the numbers are going up and something needs to be done about it because it absolutely impacts in terms of the, the UK sort of citizens in terms of their day-to-day, -day, whether it's schools, whether it's hospitals, absolutely. But what we do require is a fair system that offers uh, proper assessment. And, and for those that have no right to remain, then absolutely, you know, they, they sh there should be a process where, where they're removed. We're not disputing that. If we don't, Darren, we end up in a situation that people are here undocumented. They are more susceptible in terms of being exploited. And so the cycle of exploitation continues. So, Alp, is the solution that Rwanda plan that we heard so much about, which was, it seemed to me, no use to man, no beast, right? Because we actually can't, thanks to the European Court of Human Rights, deport anyone. That's what it looks like to me and other members of the public. I, I think Rwanda can be part of the solution. In itself, it won't solve the problem of thousands of people coming across the channel. There's got to be a whole series of merit measures in place, which I don't think we've got time to discuss now. But Rwanda can certainly be part of the overall plan to deal with the problem. And would you say leaving the ECHR would be another part of the solution? That too, I think, is, is certainly... Um, it is part okay. of the whole solution. Phil, very briefly, if you would... Yeah, very briefly, I, I agree. I mean, Rwanda isn't, uh, that's a sticky plaster if it actually happens. The reality is this is a complex issue that we need to look at from a multitude of different ways to actually find a solution. Yeah, because ultimately, Phil, all of those stuff, the modern slavery dynamic of all of this, nobody wants to see any of that going on in Britain, in modern Britain. It's, it's a farce. It needs to be sorted out. Many of my viewers are intensely frustrated. So thank you both for a very interesting contribution. Alp Memeter from Migration Watch in the studio and Phil Brewer, a specialist advisor on modern slavery from the Human Trafficking Foundation. I thank you both. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. After the break, I'm going to be giving you an analysis from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation that reckons 120 house, 1,000 households even in the UK, that's the equivalent of 400,000 people, are to be plunged into poverty when their current mortgage deal ends. Are you struggling? Let me know. First of all, though, let's have a look at the weather. Well, looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking rather wet, actually, especially across the south and east. Drier, though, with clear spells elsewhere. Let's home in on what detail. So, starting in the southwest, rather cloudy outbreaks of light rain and drizzle across the east of the region. Drier further west, where we do have a few cloud breaks developing. A much cloudier picture further east with patchy outbreaks of light rain and drizzle this evening. The rain turning much heavier around London. After a damp afternoon across Wales, conditions will improve as drier conditions arrive from the west, but cloud will linger across high ground. And crossing to the West Midlands, cloud and drizzly outbreaks clearing eastwards, clear spells during the evening, but a bit of mist and fog developing later. The cloud and rain already clearing in the northeast, with mostly dry conditions across the region, but lighter winds and a chance of mist and fog patches as well there. And then looking up to Scotland, then largely dry across Scotland, some cloud lingering across high ground, clear spells and light winds, temperatures dipping into single figures overnight, feeling rather chilly at last for November. And then looking at Northern Ireland, dry, clear spells, a few showers arriving across the very far northwest during the evening as winds pick up a little. So winds picking up then from the west as showers arrive, rain from the south and the east becoming heavier towards dawn. And that's how the weather's shaping up. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. 
And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. I thank you very much for your company. Now, folks, the Bank of England raised interest rates to 3% this week and warned that Britain is set to face its longest recession in a century. The bank initiated the biggest hike in interest rates since Black Wednesday in 1992 and warned the recession will last until at least mid-2024. The news is especially bad for those with standard variable mortgages who could see their repayments jump by more than £1,000 a year. So do we actually need to brace ourselves for two years of pretty intense pain? Well, with me now is Richard Blanco, law landlord and property expert. Richard, I nearly ennobled you there. I nearly said Lord. <laughs> now, Richard, I want to talk to you about the numbers that we're hearing there, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation claiming that mortgage rates could plunge 400,000 people into poverty. Are you, are you assuming that there, we're going to experience rises which could actually immiserate people? Well, I mean, I think the report's perhaps a little bit more gloomy than right. perhaps Good. it needs to be. But John yes. said that news. <laughs> uh, and it's probably, you know, gloomy because it wants to kind of make its point heard. I mean, interest rates have are going up already, of course. We're seeing fixes of around 6%. They are starting to fall, though, already. What we got was a kind of extra hike, I would say, of kind of 1% because of that fateful mini-budget on the 23rd of September. The markets are definitely calming now. We're seeing uh, what are called swap rates come down, and they're the rates that lenders use to set their products. So we're starting to see two- and five-year fixes closer to 5% now. And the good news is that the Bank of England actually has hinted that it doesn't think rates will need to go up as much as everybody thought. So, you know, we're probably looking at rates peaking next summer. I hope that bank rate would just get to 4%. The markets at the moment think it will get to 4.75%, 5%, but obviously we have to wait and see. So what would you advise people to do if their fixed rate is coming to an end in the not-too-distant future? What would your advice be to those homeowners who are saying, well, how long do I fix in for, you know, what will the rate be in a couple of years' time? Those sort of questions. What would your advice be to them? This is the tricky issue, isn't it? Two million of us are coming off fixed rates in the next year. And the issue is that we probably got super low rates a couple of years ago, 1 1.25, 1.45, yeah. 1.65, those sorts of rates. I would say if, you could, if you're uh, uh, imminently going to come off a fixed rate, uh, it may be worth going onto a tracker or a standard variable rate just for a few months until fixed rates actually come down because we are expecting them to start to come down again after the summer of next year. But do get advice from a, an FCA regulated mortgage advisor uh, to look at your own individual circumstances and also talk to your lender to see what options there are for, it, for existing customers because sometimes they have sort of quite cheap trackers. We are seeing trackers at the moment of about 3.75%. So it might be best sort of hanging out on that tracker for six months or so uh, and fixing later. Can I ask you about the how does this look on an international scale? Because you mentioned the mini budget, but correct me if I'm wrong, the United States of America, they're experiencing rate rises as well, aren't they? 
it looks like it things and maybe just wasn't president I assume. <laughs> not that I'm aware of no, no. <laughs> that would certainly be a shock to the American markets it, it if she was been, it yes <laughs> uh, no uh, yes well uh, we actually think that the uh, in the US they may hike rates even higher than than here and they're starting to go up as well across the eurozone so this is you're right to point out actually Darren that this is an international phenomena um, I think you know the markets have been very much calmed in the UK by the sort of double act of, of Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt. Um, and we await the outcome, of course, of the budgetary announcement on the 17th of November um, because the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England were sort of flying blind, really, this week because they weren't still not quite sure what the government intended to do. So once we get a bit more detail on that, that could help even more. But I noticed that swap rates have fallen since Thursday, so that suggests that the markets are generally calmed by what's going on. Right, so how long do you imagine this, is gonna, this uncertainty is going to go on for, then, until we get back to a a new normal, I guess. Well, the Bank of England dropped this bombshell of the two-year recession. We yes. were expecting more like sort of uh, 15 months. So uh, it's going to be a shallow recession, though. We're not expecting, you know, a huge drop in GDP. So I'm, I, I've done kind of modelling on my mortgages, you know, and where, how much they're going to go up and down. I think they're likely to start coming down next autumn. And certainly 2024 is going to be a better year for mortgages than 2023. Remember that the Bank of England and doesn't want to cause a deeper recession. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously going to try and bring rates back down again as soon as it can. So fingers crossed 2024 should be a better year for mortgage payers. On that cheery and optimistic note, we will end it there. But Richard, thank you very much for your time and contribution. My pleasure. Now, that was a bit of cheery news. Things will get better, folks. Things will get better. You're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. After the break, even Tony Blair, remember him? He's calling the latest season of The Crown complete rubbish. John Major also attacked Netflix over utterly untrue, his words, scenes showing Prince Charles lobbying the Prime Ministers to help him overthrow his mother. Now it's time for a check, though, on the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you. The headlines this hour. GB News has learnt detainees armed with various weapons have caused a disturbance during a power cut at an immigration centre near Heathrow. The Home Office says the incident happened in the early hours of this morning at Harmonsworth Immigration Removal Centre. There are more than 600 migrants at Harmonsworth who are being processed for removal from the UK. The UN chief Antonio Guterres says the world is doomed unless a historic pact is signed between rich and poor countries. His warning comes ahead of COP27 next week. Wealthy nations already promise to find $100 billion a year for poor nations to fund measures to tackle climate change. It was going to be spent in 2020, but is now not expected to come online until 2023. Here, a series of planned rail strikes due to begin today were called off, but the government's warning there could still be disruption. RMT members were due to walk out for three days, but the union said it secured a pay offer and is now entering talks. But the former general assistant of the RMT, Steve Headley, said members were furious because they hadn't been consulted. The French far-right party National Rally has elected a new leader to take over from Marine Le Pen. 27-year-old Jordan Baller will replace her, marking the first time the party's 50-year history where it is not led by a member of the Le Pen family. Jean-Marie Le Pen founded the party and led it until his daughter Marine took over in 2011. She says she'll now focus on leading the party's group in Parliament after it took 89 seats in the National Assembly earlier on this year. Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, has criticised activists who he says have pressured major advertisers to stop spending on his platform. The world's richest man defended his decision to sack around half of the company's workforce, saying all staff had been offered the right redundancy money. And amid concerns over disinformation on the site, Musk was adamant the company's commitment had not been compromised. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. We're back in just a bit.
Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akua, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Tony Blair, remember him? He's joined fellow former Prime Minister John Major, who you probably can't remember, in condemning the latest season of The Crown. The new season depicts Charles trying to recruit, recruit Blair as an ally to try and oust his mother and pave the way for him to marry Camilla Parker Bowles something that Blair has described as complete and utter rubbish. It follows John Major's description of a scene in which he's depicted trying to persuade the late Queen to abdicate as malicious nonsense. Well, with me now, I couldn't think of anyone better, is former BBC royal correspondent Michael Cole. Michael, I thank you very much for your time. If we consider the, the period being covered here by the Netflix series The Crown, around this time, you'll remember better than most, the media narrative was very much stacked against the monarch. Just how much of, of a risk was the institution placed in at that time? Darren, you're right on target there because this is series five. It starts on Wednesday and it's focused on the 1990s. And the 1990s were a desperate uh, decade for the royal family. Three of the Queen's children divorced. Windsor Castle nearly burned to the ground in 1992. Scandal after scandal happened. Fergie had her toes sucked by an American financier in the south of France. Prince Charles' conversation with Mrs. Parker Bowles, in which he was expressing his carnal desires in very stark terms, a conversation that held him up to ridicule around the world. Diana gave an interview, which we all remember, in which she said in clear terms, my husband is not fit to be king. And she also said there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Now, these things haven't been invented by the Crown. These things really happened. Um, they don't have to go looking for sensation because, as you intimated, it was a sensational, in the wrong sense for the royal family, Decade. Uh, of course, in the first two series of The Crown, one and two, uh, there was a very flattering portrait paid, plated of the Queen. Yes. It couldn't have been more so, beautifully played by a, a very good actress called Claire Foy, and I'm sure we all remember that. Now, that those two series were virtually an unpaid advertisement for a constitutional monarchy. Uh, you couldn't have bought that sort of publicity. 
Now, there were errors in that, and there were anachronisms, but nobody, not the usual subjects, started to denounce it because actually it was good news for the royal family because what was happening at that time was good news. Now, the program makers have to reflect what happened in that decade. And as I said, it was a dire decade, the 1990s. Absolutely. So, Mike, would you be in support of, and some have been calling for this, a disclaimer on the Netflix series that says, look, this, is, this isn't real life. This isn't historic, immutable truth and fact, right? This is a drama. I feel neutral about that because um, most people uh, factor that in. Whenever they're watching something, they use their common sense. You don't abdicate your common sense when you're watching anything. But if you look at it in a rather broader sense, William Shakespeare wrote, I think, about 35, 37 plays. All but one of them uh, was based upon a story that had been written, a historical story. Now, what, not one of those plays is historically accurate, reflecting what really happened, but do they reveal a higher truth? I think most people would say, even though the story of Richard III isn't historically accurate, they found some truth in it. Yes. Macbeth is not accurate. Do you find some truth in it? And I think uh, there is a certain amount of dramatic license allowed on occasions like this. Now, if you take the case of John Major, the former prime minister, and he's denounced uh, this scene involving him uh, as a barrel load of uh, malicious nonsense, I think that was the phrase. Of course, we accept that. He's a former prime minister. We expect him to tell the truth. Of course, it didn't happen because abdication, the A word, is a big taboo in the royal family. Um, the abdication of the Queen's uh, beloved uncle David, Edward VIII, on the 10th of uh, December 1936, that was blamed by the royal family uh, for causing a lot of trouble for them because it made the Queen heir apparent. And the Queen Mother, uh, she always blamed the early death of her husband, King George VI, on the fact that he had to take over from his brother. So there was never any occasion and Prince Charles would have known this. There was no possibility of the Queen abdicating because when she was crowned in 1953, she didn't make her vow to a government or all the people of this country. She made her vow to God to be, to be Queen. And yeah. she did to her dying breath. She was the Queen of this country, as we saw uh, until her last day on the 8th of September um, this year. Absolutely. As I understand it, and I'm keen to, to know whether or not you agree, there are three immediate problems facing the royal family, aren't there? There's the crown depicting the 90s, which, as you've just eloquently set out, were not a great decade for the royal family. You've got the prince... Who's going to pay for Prince Andrew now her late majesty <laughs> is gone? And you've got Harry's memoir as well. That's coming out uh, later, That's in, be uh, later that. on. Aaron. <laughs> Darren, that book, which is called Spare, is going to be a very unwelcome late uh, Christmas present. It's going to be published on January the 10th, I believe. Get your orders in now. That will not be favourite reading at Clarence House or Buckingham Palace. Every uh, chapter will be a, a headline, and the headlines will write themselves, because even if he's toned it down, uh, as reports have said he has done, there is bound to be uh, tremendous uh, criticism because he feels very slighted. I mean, he, he will not spare us, if, I, if you will excuse the pun, which is entirely intended. He will not spare us his anger, his ire, and his resentment that he feels that his wife was uh, unfairly treated, uh, was maligned in some way, uh, which caused them to leave this country. And he believes that he knows uh, who caused it all. Now, I think that the book would be an absolute damp squib if it didn't go into those areas. I mean, the, apparently the publisher, which is uh, Penguin Random House, have paid a, an enormous sum of money. I mean, a, a tremendous sum, 17 million US dollars. It must be the greatest advance ever. Well, they'll be expecting a bit of a bang for their buck. So if uh, Harry pulls his punches, I think they will become a laughing stock because people will say it, they'll buy it, and they'll say, well, here's the sandwich, where's the meat? So, Michael, then, on that point about uh, Prince Andrew, Duke of York, 
Where do you think he stands now? Well, he, he is also in a very difficult position. I mean, he's to say he's... <laughs> He's a semi-detached member of the royal family. Well, I think he's sort of at a cottage in the country. In fact, he's at Royal Lodge, the Queen Mother's old residence in Windsor Great Park. But he is a, a potential embarrassment because um, there is a problem because uh, earlier this year, we will remember that he paid damages of uh, 12 million pounds to Mrs. Uh, Virginia Giuffre uh, to settle a civil case in, uh, in New York. Now, Prince Andrew said he never met Mrs. Giuffre when she was a 17-year-old, uh, Virginia Roberts, and she, he says he never had sex with her, he didn't know the woman, he never met her. Well, he gave her uh, 12 million pounds in, in uh, dam damages. Now, Mrs. Giuffre uh, is involved with at least two other cases which may come to court in 2023, and the way these things go, he cannot be sure that he will escape the spotlight, that his name will not be mentioned again. These are all very fraught and difficult times. So there's Indeed, a lot they to be are. apprehensive about. Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting year. I think it's safe to say for the new king and the whole of the royal family. But no doubt we'll have you back, Michael, and you'll be able to take us through all of it. That was the former BBC correspondent Michael Cole there with his fantastic analysis. Now, folks, lots of you have been getting in touch with your views, much more important than mine, about the migration crisis. David has this to say, he says, as migrants leave their rooms armed with weapons, when are the do-gooders going to get it? that these people are the type of people this country does not need. Well, I mean, I don't think you're going to find many people, David, that disagree with you on that point, if you, you know, as the, even the BBC has admitted, right? Even the BBC say that there are recruitments going on for drug industries in Britain. It's not on. Janice says, it certainly is an invasion. Janice is agreeing there with Suella Braverman's comments. Particularly in the North, all the hotels are full of them. People are frightened, can't get their kids in school, can't get houses, can't get GP appointments. We need to level up and make sure the posh areas like Islington take their fair share. Janice, you agree with me then, don't you, that actually I think what we should do is send each virtue signalling MP that criticised Suella Braverman, send them a share of the migration. Now, Matthew says this, why are they allowed to apply for asylum if they arrive illegally? They have broken the law. Matthew, I think you raise a perfectly valid point. If you are a lawbreaker and you come in here wantonly breaking the law, why on earth should you expect bed, board and benefits from the British taxpayer. It's an absurdity. Patricia says, I'm sick of the people who make money out of trying to keep them here, charities and lawyers. They contribute to the racism because people are so tired of having their world changed and not for the better. Why does the word invasion upset folk? It's the true word. I wonder if the Home Office civil servants sometimes are to blame for not processing things quickly enough. I mean, Patricia, it is an interesting point, isn't it, that the processing has taken such a long time. You know, why it's not beyond the wit of man, surely, to process these claims a lot faster than what we are. Jenny had this to say, excellent report from Darren, I thank you very much, Jenny, on illegal immigrants. However, the same people are rolled up on programme after programme saying that something must be done but no concrete solutions. A friend in accident and emergency overnight this week reported that the centre was full of drunks and migrants. No wonder the NHS is in such a state of crisis. And I think, Jenny, you raise a really valid point because fundamentally public services in this country are overstretched. We've just spent goodness only knows how many billions during the pandemic. We cannot afford to be massively pumping cash into public services, which are already massively overstretched. We cannot be the, the breadbasket and the ultimate end destination of every migrant that wants to come here. It's not possible. Barbara says, rationally, if people arrive in a safe country in Europe, then try to enter another country illegally because they prefer the United Kingdom, concealing their true identity by discarding documentation and phones, paying criminals thousands of pounds to assist them, they are already criminals themselves. At the very least, 
They're dishonest and devious people. I welcome genuine refugees coming directly from countries where they are persecuted and who have no need to deceive us. And Barbara, that's the, the fundamental, that's the age-old question, isn't it, right? If you, if you cannot, if you genuinely have a claim to seek asylum in this country, why do you need to throw your documents overboard when you get in, into one of those dinghies over here? It doesn't make sense. Anyway, now to a community who celebrate bonfire night in their own way. In the small town of Edenbridge in Kent, they've held a long tradition of erecting effigies of public figures. This year's 11 metre high the figure will probably come to no surprise for, for many of us, as our national reporter Theo Chicomba has been finding out. It's a day many people have been waiting for. Bonfire Nights returning here in Edenbridge for the first time since 2019. More than a thousand people are expected to attend. It's, it's quite a big deal really because you really do notice it. Those two years where there weren't too many things going on in town, it's really nice to have the community back together supporting each other, to have the excitement of the bonfire works, uh, you know, the bonfire night going on. So it's just the whole general buzz and excitement around town is just such a nice feeling to have. But they do things a little different here. For 20 years, the organisers have used it as an opportunity to poke fun at political figures like the former leader of the House of Commons, to celebrities like Harvey Weinstein, and this year's no different. It's no surprise that the shortest serving prime minister has been the talk of the town leading up to this evening. People love it, but people have always got an opinion. It's like art, they've always got an opinion. Some people like it, some people might not like it. It's not like it's, it's anything nasty or anything. Everyone loves it, it's a long standing tradition. And to be honest, it's, it's a celebrity guy, it is what it is. Uh, depending on what year it is, somebody's face is going to be on there, so. After a three-year break, it's been welcomed by those who serve the local economy. It's a thing for, for the moment for Edenbridge, being a, a small village, um, is that it's, it's bringing back that real tradition that Edenbridge has been known for. So everyone's very excited. The businesses are very excited to see this happening again. And we want it to remain for the future and have no further gaps, which I think is the important part. But, you know, it's going to be good to see some of the children's faces and, and some of those families that haven't seen this for a while, and some that have never experienced it. If previous years are to go by, it's certainly going to be a memorable bonfire night, especially with recent political events. The Age Cumber, GB News. Thank you, Theo. Poor Liz Truss. I tell you what, as well, they're talking about banning these kind of things in the not-too-distant future because of our net zero targets, can you believe? Anyway, moving on, the government has denied reports that plans for the Sizewell Sea nuclear power plant are under review. There were reports that Sizewell Sea was one of many major projects being reviewed as the government looks to cut public spending. But Downing Street quashed those reports yesterday. In fact, Rishi Sunak's spokesman said that the Prime Minister hoped to get a deal over the line as soon as possible, adding that talks with private firms over funding had been constructive and were still ongoing. No surprises there, folks. We are, after all, facing an energy emergency. So should we welcome this news? Well, joining me to discuss this is the former CEO of Energy UK, Angela Knight. Angela, I thank you very much for your time. Do you welcome the government's decision not to scrap the Sizewell C project? I mean, could you just put it into perspective for my viewers? How much of an impact would this project have on securing Britain's energy independence? Well, quite a bit, because if it is built, then it's about 7% of the electricity consumption in the UK. So that's a decent chunk. But I think we also have to recognise that even if the go-ahead is given tomorrow and the funders have come in and all that sort of thing, it's probably going to be about 10 years before it's online. So whilst I do think it's a good thing, at the same time, we need to address some of the energy security matters earlier than that. Uh, we've, uh, for example, uh, we've, we've now got with Rolls-Royce the small-scale nuclear power stations, which can be built both much quicker and more cheaply. 
And we can't just carry on building intermittent, you know, the, the wind, without the backup. And that's the, that backup piece is the bit that seems to have been too long forgotten by the decision makers. And that's one of the reasons that we're in difficulties now. After all, this winter we are, I'm sure, going to be starting the last of our coal-fired power stations up. Well, that's fine. At least we've got some. It's not going to help you on the climate change. And so it's actually getting some of this quicker backup, the smaller scale backup done uh, and, and underway very quickly is where I think the attention also needs to go as far as government is concerned. And Angela, t talking about all of these projects, the government likes to wax lyrical, as you well know, as far as its net zero agenda is concerned, that actually it's going to be a massive job creator. Would nuclear power plants, like even the small scale reactors that you mentioned there, would they be a big investment for jobs and opportunities in this country? Yes, they would. You see, what I envisage, what many of us envisage, is that where the attention now needs to be paid, as it paid is on not just one small scale nuclear reactor, but a whole series of them. Um, as I say, they take about two years to build. So that makes them much more attractive for investors because investors have not got to wait a long time, you know, 10 years before the thing starts operating. We also are running very close anyway to our, um, our electricity production. By close, I mean, you know, demand and supply because we cannot assume that we can import through our interconnectors from Europe because most of Europe is in a much harder situation than we are. And so it's not going to have any surplus power to export. So what I think would be the best thing for government to do is, yes, by all means, continue with Sizewell as long as you can get funding for it, because those big power stations, because of the cost and delay, tend to be built off either our government's balance sheet or somebody else. After all, uh, the one at Hinkley is being built off uh, the French balance sheet. You know, that's that's. That, that's a tricky thing to do. But if you can get, say, 10, a dozen of the smaller ones built, you put them on the same site as our existing or nuclear power stations, because then you've got all the connections. As I say, two billion pounds in two years and you're up and running is something that the private sector will invest in. So let's do that as well. Yeah, and Angela, then I wonder what you say to some of my viewers who are concerned, actually, that we've got the likes of the French coming over and building these kinds of things, when they're saying, well, actually, is this not an argument for the United Kingdom to have its own nationalised, state-owned energy company that's able to do these things themselves? Yes, it, there, there has been a case for some time for us to have. In fact, we used to have, of course, you know, the UK used to have all this capability. We were early off when we built our existing uh, nuclear power stations. We did a good job. They've been safe, yeah. they've been re reliable, and they've run for actually considerably longer than they were originally intended. So I don't think anybody should think that the UK has not done a good job. It has. But then, of course, whatever it was, 20, 30 years, almost fallow, 20 years fallow, where nuclear became one of these things you didn't talk about, people were worried about, you know, you didn't invest. Um, actually, that was a very stupid situation to let ourselves get into. But you can't unmake the past. What you can do is you can make something of the future. And inside Rolls-Royce is a very strong team, very big development has been going on there. They've built, after all, uh, nuclear power into submarines and the like for many, many years. So we've got the knowledge. Yeah. They can build out the capacity. And you're absolutely right. Then it is, you know, something that is much more within the UK's control. I'm not a great one for nationalising, but I am a great one for saying, let's do it if we've got the knowledge and let's do it here. So, you know, use our people, um, create our jobs, our technology. And that's where I think we can go and go strongly with those small scale power stations and quickly. And speed is important. And Angela, I tell you what, if it was in my gift, I'd make you Baroness Nice and have you as an energy secretary. I tell you that much. But former CEO of Energy UK, Angela Knight there, thank you as ever. Unite National Officer for Energy, Simon Coop, said this. He said, at a time of chronic energy insecurity and perilous energy costs, why on earth would the government even consider pulling the promised investment in the Sizewell C nuclear reactor? To allow such speculation to grow is irresponsible and jeopardises 
is the future of the plant. Cutting back on Sizewell not only undermines the UK's commitment to achieve net zero, but threatens our ability to keep the lights on in the future. It's nonsensical. Far from reneging on the promise to build Sizewell C, the government should be investing in the jobs, energy, stability and diversity that new build nuclear energy provides. It's not often I agree with trade unions, but there we are. I do this time. You're watching Real Britain, folks. We're going to have more after this very short break. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. <laughs> Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello and welcome back to Real Britain on your TV, radio and online. Coming up in this hour, a victory for free speech. The government has announced that the legal but harmful clause in the online safety bill has been dropped. Hurrah to that, I say. But does this risk placing children at risk, as some are arguing? And the Bank of England has warned that Britain faces a two-year recession in the aftermath of the economic turmoil of this year and, of course, paying vast sums during the pandemic. But how is it going to affect the penny in your pocket? And first of all, though, let's get the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you and good afternoon to you. Our top story on GB News today, counter-terrorism police say the firebombing of an immigration processing centre in Dover in Kent was motivated by an extreme right-wing terrorist ideology. Officers say evidence, including digital media devices, have been recovered during an investigation. Andrew Leake from High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire is believed to have thrown up to three incendiary devices at the Western Jetfoil site in Kent last weekend. There were no major injuries. The 66-year-old later was found dead by police at a nearby petrol station. And GB News has learned detainees armed with various weapons have caused a disturbance during a power cut at an immigration centre in West London. The Home Office says the incident happened in the early hours of this morning at Harmonsworth Immigration Removal Centre near Heathrow. 
No one was injured during the incident and authorities are still on scene. There are more than 600 migrants at the Harmonsworth Centre who are being processed for removal from the UK. The UN's chief, Antonio Guterres, says the world is doomed unless a historic pact is signed between rich and poor countries. His warning comes ahead of COP27 next week. Wealthy nations have already promised to find £88 billion a year for poor nations to fund measures to tackle climate change. This was originally meant to come online in 2020, but is now not expected to happen until 2023. And that comes as Australia's east coast is dealing with a fourth flood crisis this year. New South Wales has evacuated people from their homes and cleared livestock from land ahead of an expected peak in floodwaters. Flooding has left thousands of people homeless and left agricultural businesses in tatters. Australia and the Pacific nations have announced they're going to launch a co-host bid for the 2026 UN Climate Summit. We're back at the international table. Unlike recent COPs where Australia was seen as part of the group which actually was working to stop progress, to get in the way of, the pro of progress, Australia will be a willing and active participant in these discussions. Well, here a series of planned rail strikes due to start today have been called off, but the government's warning there could still be significant disruption. RMT members were due to walk out for three days, but the union said it's secured a pay offer and is now talking. But the former Assistant General Secretary at the RMT, Steve Headley, said members are furious because they didn't know anything about it. The situation where the strike's been called off and the members don't know why. Mm. And the, the, the explanation's been given at the minute don't make sense. Intensive negotiations, well, what were they doing before? If there's a deal on the table, let the members have a look at it. Mm. The members will soon say yes or no. Now, Sinn Féin's leader says if an executive in Northern Ireland can't be restored, a joint authority between the British and Irish governments could be a plan B. Mary Lee MacDonald made the comments ahead of her keynote speech at her party's conference this evening. The country has been without a functioning executive since February as the DUP continues to boycott the Assembly over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Chair of the Northern Ireland Conservatives, Matthew Robinson, told GB News a solution has to be found. We either need a, restora a restoration of the devolved government or we need some form of direct rule from Westminster. We deserve proper governance in Northern Ireland. We have a collapsing healthcare system here. I mean, we are in dire straits in terms of waiting times. We are in the middle of a cost of living crisis and, and, as well, just like the rest of the, the UK. We need proper governance. In France, the far-right party, the National Rally, has elected a new leader to take over from Marine Le Pen. 27-year-old Jordan Bardella will replace her, marking the first time the party's 50-year history hasn't been led by a member of the Le Pen family. Jean-Marie Le Pen founded the party and led it until his daughter Marine took over in 2011. She says she'll now focus on leading the party's group in Parliament after it took 89 seats in the National Assembly earlier this year. And lastly, Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, has criticised activists who he says have pressured major advertisers to stop spending on his platform. The world's richest man defended his decision to sack around half of the company's workforce, saying all staff who'd been laid off had been offered three months' redundancy money. And amid concerns over disinformation on the site, Musk is adamant the company's commitment to content moderation has not been compromised. You're with GB News. We'll have more news as it happens. Now back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up on this next hour. The legal but harmful clause that's going to be watered down from the online safety bill, requiring the larger digital companies to address state-determined categories of legal speech, like disinformation or hate speech. Is this a win for freedom of speech or a hit to online protection? The Bank of England has warned that the UK is facing its longest recession since records began as it raised interest rates by the biggest hike in 33 years. It warned that the United Kingdom would face a very challenging two-year slump with unemployment nearly doubling by 2025. 
and the Conservatives risk losing dozens of seats at the next election if ministers don't take action over the migrant crisis because of the threat of a new UKIP-style party. They're not my words, they're the words of Craig McKinley, Tory MP for South Thanet in Kent, of course bearing the blunt, the brunt of much of this. He's warned that a Nigel Farage-style party could actually pick up votes from Tory voters that are frustrated about government inaction on immigration. Does he have a point? Lots of you are getting in touch with me on gbviews at gbnews.uk and saying just that. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. Do keep getting in touch. Tweet me at gbnews. You can watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of fantastic content on our GB News page. Cheers very much. Now, the government has announced that the legal but harmful clause in the online safety bill, it was a very controversial clause, has now been dropped. The controversial clause would have allowed more remit for police and speech online, as if there isn't enough of that already, and its removal has been praised by free speech campaigners like myself. But proponents of the clause say it's necessary to protect children on the internet. But in this digital age, who is ultimately responsible for child safety? And can we do it whilst also upholding freedom of speech online? Well, joining me to discuss this is the Executive Director of the Open Rights Group, Jim Killick, and Matthew Lesh, Head of Public Policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Jim, where do, we, where do we strike the balance here? What's the halfway house? Because there are cases like the, the Archie Battersby case, for example, where you know, you've got the influence of TikTok, for example, playing a role in, in child safety and all of these other issues. Where do we strike the balance between freedom of speech online and the protection of some of society's most vulnerable groups? Well, you know, it is genuinely hard, but I think we have to uh, remember that the burden of protecting children has to be on uh, adults, it has to be on uh, their parents, it has to be on teachers. Um, in the same way as we can't stop uh, the possibility of danger when a child goes on the street, uh, down to a park, you know, you can't you can't remove danger entirely. And to try to pretend that we can uh, is is to place a burden on 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 society, which is entirely unreasonable. You know, we can't cotton wool uh, the entire of our playgrounds in case there are accidents. That that's not a reasonable proposition. No one's proposing it, but we are apparently proposing that for the internet. Um, the thing, the 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 key thing we have to do, I think, is to remember that the way that children evolve is that they get more access to content, they get more access to websites, they get more freedom as they grow up. And it is parents and teachers who understand the development of a child so that they know the kind of responsibilities they can take. Expecting technology to do this when the technology cannot understand the mind or the responsibility or the maturity of a child is asking for an awful lot of problems and it is likely also to stunt the development of children, I'm afraid oh. to say. OK, so Matthew, then, on that point, you've got the likes of Nadine Dorries, who was the former minister, cabinet minister, that was actually putting through the online safety bill. She's saying the government absolutely must keep it in place, keep it intact. Why is she wrong and you right? <laughs> Look... The, what the government's talking about doing, it seems, is removing the legal but harmful provisions in the online safety rule as they result uh, and relate to adults. Now, now the technical phrase in the in legislation is um, content that is harmful to adults. I don't think that the government's looking at removing um, the provisions in relation to children whatsoever. Now, as Jim said, I think that they provide a bit of false hope. But the, the, the idea that removing sections of the bill that purely relate to adults, that purely try to censor um, what individuals who are... Uh, of adult age in any way related to protecting children is going to fix uh, the or cause problems for children is obviously ridiculous. But what I think um, the problem here is it's not like free speech is suddenly being solved because we've got rid of legal but harmful for adults. I think at a much more deeper level, the legislation needs to be reconsidered. Um, the, the legislation requires general monitoring for a whole range of priority content areas. That means the, the online digital companies having to look at what you're saying and make judgments about whether or not they think things are illegal in an instantaneous way using automated systems. Now, they have to do that not at the normal kind of legal threshold, but they have to remove anything they reasonably believe 
believe could be illegal. So the government is effectively lowering the thresholds for removing of illegal content, making the firms automatically go through all our speech online, and they're not expecting that to have a negative impact on free speech. I think it's it's extremely dangerous uh, for free speech uh, in its current state, even without legal but harmful provisions. Yeah, because and, and let's remember also, Jane, let's remember just, also it, it means that people have to be verified and checked whether they're adults or not for this to work. Because the, this content still has to be checked. The question is, when you go onto Twitter, when you go on a Reddit, uh, are you an adult or a child? Does that site know that you're an adult or a child? And of course it doesn't, right? It has literally no idea. So it has to censor everything as if you are a child until you prove you're an adult, which means what? uploading passports, having your face checked by some kind of identity software, um, you know, sharing your bank card details. We end up in the whole situation we were debating about for pornography a few years ago, but now it's not just pornography sites, it's literally all the sites that you visit every day at the moment. And then you ask yourself, you know, are these companies all going to do that? I mean, well, some of I, them will not. Some of, I, some of them I, would just yes, say, well, I, I dare say you know, Elon Musk would, 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 would sh shriek at doing such a thing. And I tell you what, <laughs> a lot of my viewers who are emailing in now will shriek in horror at the idea that big tech keeps a bank of all of our identification and, you know, has everything on us that they can possibly obtain. I mean, Matthew Lesh, you are someone who I assume is naturally opposed to that sort of measure. But is that the route that we've got to go down in order to protect children online? Well, I think we've, we've got to be careful about not giving us a sense of, of false security. As I think Jim has, has quite persuasively tried to explain, no matter what you do, uh, children are going to face, in fact, we're all going to face dangers in our lives. And the idea that we can magic that away with a piece of legislation is, is purely mythic. Um, I think the other issue as well with the bill in, in this respect, though, is not just the fact that you're going to be scanning um, everyone's face potentially to work out their age, but also in order for the content requirements to work, you're going to be scanning everyone's private messaging as well, including it, potentially encrypted communications. And, and what, you, what we're getting from this discussion is this is a 270-page piece of legislation. It's extremely complex. Its broads are, uh, its goals are broad. It gives it, 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 quite extraordinary um, discretionary powers of Ofcom to interpret all these different parts and decide what they're going to mean. It is a, a recipe for, for censorship and state control and state direction of the internet and what we're allowed to believe and what we're allowed to say and what we're allowed to think. And I think it's quite scary that the Conservative government's going ahead with this. So, Matthew, would you like to see even more parts of the bill removed? I mean, absolutely. I think I think the government shouldn't be going ahead of the general monitoring. I think they need to be very careful about um, putting in requirements to um, age verify users or age assure users. I think they need to definitely take out encrypted communications from the scope and, and private communications from the scope of this legislation. What I message between you and I, Darren, shouldn't be a matter for uh, Ofcom guidance or big tech um, oversight. Uh, I think there's a whole bunch of very important changes government needs to make. And that's before we even think about the regulatory burdens here. What is this going to cost for British businesses? Uh, why are we having a, a more regulated um, sector than the, the EU? I thought we left the EU um, to have less regulation, less red tape, not to be harsher on some of the world's most innovative companies, as well as um, quite harsh by our own startups and, and smaller companies in the UK who might struggle to comply. Yeah, Jim, as well as coming back to that, I'm wondering what's happened to the role of the parent, right? Why are parents allowing children, you know, off the leash on the internet, running wild, knowing that there's this vast amount of con content on the internet for children to potentially come across? Do you think actually we need to have that conversation about saying, well, actually, the, the impetus should be on the parent rather than big tech? Look, I mean, it's not that big tech should do nothing. Of course it isn't. And of course there are things that can sensibly be done. But I think, you know, the, you look at, say, the Netherlands, you know, it's, it's always those kind of countries, right, where they have the, the conversations with their kids. They talk to them, they start to explain the risks, and the, the kids become more resilient and they understand how to avoid the problems on the internet. Here, we just pretend the whole thing's not a problem, sweep it under the carpet, say well, no, someone else will deal with it. And of course, the, the children don't get properly educated and that puts them at, more at risk. I think 
yes, we do have to have that sensible conversation. We also have to remember that kids are very tech savvy. So if we expect that the solutions are going to be delivered by technology, well, that again, it's just just ignoring what will actually happen. What will happen if these sites do end up with age barriers for just the UK is children will, particularly teenagers, will uh, work out how to use VPNs, which they all do anyway. Um, they will go and log in pretending that they're in Germany or in Switzerland or something. And, you know, the whole problem just persists. But we can all pretend it's been solved and uh, be happy about it. Um, meanwhile, who really suffers? Well, of course, it's the children who are not being educated about those risks and who are putting themselves in danger without those conversations being had. So, yes, we absolutely have to have that conversation. We also have to be realistic about what technology does and what it doesn't do is solve uh, social problems. It, you know, it helps us communicate, but it doesn't order society or tell change people's motivations or the things that they desire to look at or the things they want to explore. It, do, it cannot, cannot do that. Yeah, and I worry actually that there are severe unintended consequences to this bill. But as Matthew Lesh will well know, who hasn't met a politician that accidentally ends up falling foul of unintended consequences? But folks, we're going to have to leave it there. Jim Killock, Executive Director of the Open Rights Group, and Matthew Lesh, Head of Public Policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. I thank you both for your time. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come for you this afternoon on Real Britain. After the break, we're going to talk about the Bank of England warning of the UK facing the longest recession since records began as it raised interest rates by the most in 33 years. It warned that the United Kingdom would face a very challenging two-year slump with unemployment nearly doubling by 2025. Cheery stuff, eh? First of all, let's have a look at the weather. Well, looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking rather wet, actually, especially across the south and east. Drier, though, with clear spells elsewhere. Let's home in on what detail. So, starting in the southwest, rather cloudy, outbreaks of light rain and drizzle across the east of the region, drier further west, where we do have a few cloud breaks developing. A much cloudier picture further east with patchy outbreaks of light rain and drizzle this evening, the rain turning much heavier around London. After a damp afternoon across Wales, conditions will improve as drier conditions arrive from the west, but cloud will linger across high ground. And crossing to the West Midlands, cloud and drizzly outbreaks clearing eastwards, clear spells during the evening, but a bit of mist and fog developing later. The cloud and rain already clearing in the northeast, with mostly dry conditions across the region, but lighter winds and a chance of mist and fog patches as well there. And then looking up to Scotland, then largely dry across Scotland, some cloud lingering across high ground, clear spells and light winds, temperatures dipping into single figures overnight, feeling rather chilly at last for November. And then looking at Northern Ireland, dry, clear spells, a few showers arriving across the very far northwest during the evening as winds pick up a little. So winds picking up then from the west as showers arrive, rain from the south and the east becoming heavier towards dawn, and that's how the weather's shaping up. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship 
and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Now, the Bank of England has warned that Britain faces a two-year recession in the aftermath of the economic turmoil of this year and, of course, the pandemic. But what would a recession mean for ordinary families and business? And can the government alleviate the current mess? These are the questions on many people's minds as the costs of essentials and goods increases and the global economy still recovers, of course, from lockdowns and the war in Ukraine. Well, with me now is Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor for the Centre for Economic and Business Research. Vicky, I thank you for your time. Could you just explain to our viewers what these Bank of England forecasts actually mean? And are you on the same page as them? Are you as pessimistic, Vicky, as the bank is perhaps being? Well, what the Bank of England is forecasting is that we're going to probably have um, negative growth for the rest of this year. So if you just look from the middle of this year onwards to the end of this year, probably a decline, not very big one, under 1%. Um, but then that slowdown that we're already experiencing, possibly a recession, will carry on for a couple of years. And that is unprecedented in terms of the length uh, that they expect this recession to last. It's not going to be very deep, according to them. The real worry is that when we get out of it, we're still not going to be growing very fast at all. So we're not going back to any serious growth. And if you just think about the list trust period, when we were talking about growth is the answer to the debt issues, but it's not going to be because that growth is going to be very anemic. We're still talking about growth of perhaps not more than 1% for a number of years to come after that. Liz Truss not have it right then? Was she not right to recognise that actually economic growth is what's going to get her out of this mess? She's right about that completely in the sense that it's growth we need. The real problem is how do you get it? You don't necessarily get it by just cutting taxes, especially at a time when inflation is so high. Um, so what you need, of course, is an environment, a global environment, which is more sort of uh, looking at expanding rather than contracting, which is where we are now. And there is an imminent global recession yeah. uh, staring us in the face. And in that environment, you can't really grow. But there are a number of things that could happen. So the war could finish. Uh, for example, we could see some of the price declines that uh, we've already witnessed in gas prices, in 
um, energy prices more generally, particularly oil. Uh, that's coming down, has been coming down. Food prices have been declining for the last six months, the international food prices, not what the consumer in the UK is paying, of course, because some of the previous increases are still coming through to the system. Uh, but overall, there could be some better environment coming through. But at the moment, what we're doing in the UK, certainly, which is going to inhibit growth, is that we're both raising taxes, uh, probably, and uh, we expect to hear more on November the 17th, uh, and possibly cutting public spending, but also we're increasing interest rates at the same time. So it's a cut, cut, cut environment we are right in at present, and that's not going to provide any growth at all. Yeah, and Vicky, um, as you will know by now, former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, he actually blamed Brexit for some of the economic difficulties we're currently facing. Do you think that's fair? I think up to a point, we have seen that inflation in the UK has tended to be higher because we had supply constraints which were worse because of Brexit than would otherwise have been the case. And also, of course, we've had quite a lot of pressure on wages because there have been quite substantial staff shortages that we've seen in many occupations. So if you add those two and the fact that we have also lost quite a lot of our trade intensity, so we're not actually uh, trading as much with the EU and strangely, we're not trading as much with the world as we did before, then Brexit could be uh, partly to blame for that. But there are, of course, other reasons, the international uh, factors that I mentioned earlier, the war in Ukraine, rise in prices that we have seen, and the slowdown everywhere, really, sort of gas supplies restricted in Europe, there's probably going to be some rationing, it's going to affect us as well without any doubt. Absolutely. I, I think Brexit sort of... Uh... Seems like it was a million years ago now, Vicky, given all that's happened since then. But Vicky Price, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Chief Economic Advisor for the Centre for Economic and Business Research, I thank you for your time as ever. That's Vicky Price there. Now, folks, it's time for Grind Watch, a time to look at what you at home have been telling me about the biggest stories of the week. So this week, I took to Twitter to ask this question. Does Britain need a new political party? A simple question. Plenty of you got in touch about this. This was after Craig McKinley MP, the bloke that's just been on screen for my radio listeners, who said actually there might be, because of the migration issue, a new right-wing political party founded in this country. Harry says this, the UK absolutely needs a right-wing party which would keep our borders secure take focus away from finance in London, invest in industries in marginal areas, get a grip on law and order and the police, focus on trade. Y music to my ears, Harry, music to my ears. It's beggar's belief why uh, the priorities of our politicians are so out of kilter with the priorities of the public. And he says this, we need a centre ground party and anything with UK in its name, it's just going to sound too nationalistic. We need a party that actively pursues policies that benefit individuals and our environment. The closest we have are the Green Party. Time to trust them. Well, hey, I tell you what, I went to university in Brighton when they had a Green Council and bins weren't collected. The place looked filthy. They, they couldn't organise a booze up in a brewery. I tell you that much for free. So. There we are, folks. If the Green Party are centrist, I must be somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun. Moving on. Pete says, it seems the only way to make the Conservative Party act like Conservatives is to have a UKIP-type party always present, always holding their feet to the fire. Pete, we're going to have Richard Tice on the show shortly, and he, hopefully, is going to be selling a case why he's the man to hold the Tory feet to the fire. Derek says this, no! Not another new political party, which will only split the vote. We need the smaller parties to merge into one unified party, ensuring a viable alternative to both Conservative and Labour. Let's break the two-party system. And Derek, you raise an interesting point there, because if you look at where the British public stand on the political spectrum, quite to the left on economics, you know, pro-nationalised energy and rail net infrastructure, and to the right, right, on the culture war issues. So on, you know, the trans madness, not certainly not with the Labour Party, but with the Conservative Party, but more with the Labour Party on economics. Is there really a party that's selling that? 
Who knows? Stacey says, this is a difficult one. Can't trust the ones we have, but equally, it'd be just as difficult to trust a brand new party. Just wish the ones we have would get the finger out and stop all this nonsense that's going on these days. We are a laughing stock. Stacey, I think you're right. I think there are so many things in this country that aren't working. I think the fact that we aren't taking the migration crisis seriously enough, the fact that you've got politicians blaming Suella Braverman, I think it's an utter lunacy. It's a farce. It makes us look like an international laughing stock. You're absolutely right. Folks, these are with GB News on telly and DAB radio. If Grime Watch whetted your appetite, then don't go anywhere. Because after the break, the Conservatives risk losing dozens of seats at the next general election if ministers don't take action over the migrant crisis because of the threat of a new UKIP-style party. Those aren't my words, those are the words of Craig McKinley, MP for South Thanet in Kent. We'll be talking to him after the news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon to you. GB News has learned detainees armed with various weapons have caused a disturbance during a power cut at an immigration centre near Heathrow. The Home Office says the incident happened in the early hours of the um, morning at the Harmonsworth Immigration Removal Centre. There are 600 immigrants at Harmonsworth who are being processed for removal from the UK. The UN's chief, Antonio Guterres, says the world is doomed unless... A historic pact is signed between rich and poor countries. His warning comes ahead of COP27 next week. Wealthy nations have already promised to find $100 billion a year for poor nations to fund measures to tackle climate change. That was originally meant to start in 2020, but now is not expected to come online until next year. Counter-terrorism police say the firebombing of an immigration processing centre in Dover was motivated by an extreme right-wing terrorist ideology. Officers say evidence, including digital media devices, had been recovered during their investigation. Andrew Leake from High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire is believed to have thrown up to three incendiary devices at the Western Jet Foil site in Kent last weekend. There were no major injuries. The 66-year-old was found dead later by police at a petrol station. And a series of planned rail strikes due to start today were called off, but the government's warning there could still be significant disruption. RMT members were due to walk out for three days, but the union secured a pay offer and is now talking. But the former Assistant General Secretary at the RMT, Steve Headley, said members were furious because they didn't know about the conversations. The French far-right party, the National Rally, has elected a new leader to take over from Marine Le Pen. 27-year-old Jordan Bardella will replace her, marking the first time the party's 50 years history where it's not led by a member of the Le Pen family. Jean-Marie Le Pen founded the party and led it until his daughter Marine took over in 2011. She says she'll now focus on leading the party's group in Parliament after it took 89 seats in the National Assembly earlier this year. Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, has criticised activists who he says have pressured major advertisers to stop spending on his platform. The world's richest man defended his decision to sack around half of the company's workforce, saying all staff who'd been laid off were offered three months' redundancy. And amid concerns over disinformation on the site, Musk was adamant the company's commitment to content moderation had not been compromised. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, you're with GB News. Darren is back in a moment. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations. For helping our great nation find its voice, we are here for you on radio, television and online. 
across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun. Every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain on GB News, on your telly, online and on your digital radio. Now, the government is being urged to scrap the first new coal mine in 30 years. Campaigners have warned it'll devastate the UK's reputation on the climate crisis and contribute to global carbon emissions. However, many feel as much energy as needed is required to actually push through what's sure to be a really tough winter. And let's not forget, folks, we need coal to make steel for those great big whopping wind turbines that everyone wants to build. It comes as Rishi Sunak announces that he'll attend the COP27 conference and that is government's decision to reinstate the ban on fracking. With me now is my good friend, Reform UK leader, Richard Tice. Richard, thank you for your time. I mean, this is all part of stupid decisions because of that asphyxiating target of net zero, isn't it? Good afternoon, Darren. Well, this is extraordinary, isn't it? The opportunity to create hundreds and hundreds of jobs in a deprived area of northwest of England. And it's been stuck in the planning process, the political process, for years and years and years. And here's the madness, Darren. We're importing over 4 million tonnes of coking coal to be used in the UK from places like Australia, where I've just been. 300,000 tonnes of coal from Australia every year, from the US, just until recently, from Russia, from Colombia, from all over the place. And yet we've got it under our feet. So we could actually use our own coal, create jobs here, keep our money here, Darren, and guess what? We would actually save CO2 emissions rather than shipping it thousands and thousands of miles across the world. It absolutely beggars belief. It really does that you know we're still importing coal from overseas. We can create so much wealth here. We've got this treasure under our feet, Darren, and I just find it absolutely tragic. And the great thing is we can also be a world leader in emerging new technologies, in carbon capture and storage, so that you capture the CO2 emissions from when you are uh, burning coal, and then you stick that into the huge caverns and reserves off the North Sea or wherever. So again, we can save emissions, we can be a world leader in technology, and we can create British jobs and keep our money here. What's not to like, Darren? Yeah, well, before I get on to asking you about Craig McKinley MP, the Tory MP, his comments on a new political party being necessary, I can think of one man who might tell us he's the answer. <laughs> but do you reckon the Tories can actually be trusted on energy? Are we going to be energy independent? There's no chance at all under the Tories that we'll be energy independent. Let's remind everybody, for 25 years, between 1980 and 2005, we were self-reliant on our own energy. Does anyone remember? threats of blackouts and rationing and government subsidies because energy prices were so high. No, because we, we were using our own energy treasure and you had none of this nonsense. The moment you had uh, a growing quantity of expensive, heavily subsidized renewables, offshore wind turbines, electricity prices soared, they become ever more unreliable and we are where we are. We all know what's going on. Uh, the threats of rationing is huge. Most people can't afford the current market price for energy, the government's subsidising it. We're in a world of hurt, totally self-inflicted, 
Uh, we've had, I think, 12 years, Darren, 12 years of Tory rule. And this is the mess they've led us into. A lot of my viewers, Richard, are saying, well, actually, the, the British should have its own state-owned energy company that can actually invest back in to the British people. Would Reform UK back those kinds of moves? Yeah, look, I think there are key elements of our energy and utility resources where you can have a win-win of what I call a joint venture, where the, the, the taxpayer owns, let's say, 50% of these critical utilities, critical energy firms, and then British pension funds on behalf of British pensioners owns the other 50% with private sector management. Because governments can fund things, they're incredibly bad at managing things. But there's a win-win solution, and that way, you stop the rip-offs. And when that sort of company has a good year, the taxpayer benefits. When it has a bad year, and all companies do, you take it on the chin. What people are sick and tired of, Darren, is being ripped off by primarily foreign-owned energy producers who are having it off at the moment uh, to a huge extent. Uh, and in a sense, the market is the market. But it's us, the British consumer, that's having to pay these high prices. The government's now using taxpayer funding for the subsidies to make these foreign-owned energy firms even richer. You couldn't make it up. You couldn't. And I dare say a lot of my viewers, this is music to their ears, Richard, but I'm hoping you're going to play sweet, sweet music when I ask you this next question. Craig McKinley, he's saying there might be a new political party that actually captures many members of the electorate who are sick to their back teeth of being told by politicians that they're the ones that will secure Britain's borders, when actually we've got borders that are leakier than a sieve. How do you think you can actually, one, solve that issue, and two, are you the party Reform UK to do it? Well, of course we are, Darren, and you understand, Craig. I mean, he can't promote the opposition, but he is deeply concerned, as are many other Tory MPs, that we are going to take tens of tens of thousands, possibly millions of votes from them. We're going up in the polls. We've already taken huge numbers of members from the Tory party who are resigning in droves and joining reform. We're six or seven percent in the polls, as I say, and rising. And we're the only party that will stop the boats. We will literally stop the boats. And that's what tens of millions of people across this great nation of ours want to happen. We're all being ripped off. It's an absolute outrage. And it's the kind and compassionate thing to do. We all get attacked by the left for saying that we're heartless. They're the heartless people for continuing to encourage rather than stop this appalling trade. Absolutely. All right, we'll leave it there. Richard Tice there, Reform UK leader. We'll find out in my emails, Richard, if you've sold to the electorate there. Now, the current migrant crisis and the Conservative government's record of failure on the issues has led many to as I say, state that a new party on the right is a distinct possibility. Former UKIP member turned Tory MP Craig McKinley was the latest to say the creation of a, a, a migration party and a, a, someone that's actually saying, look, we can solve this issue, would come a long way in hobbling Conservative electoral support if they didn't manage to resolve the issue. Craig McKinley, I'm delighted to say, joins me now, Conservative MP for South Thanet. Craig, thank you very much for your time. You've heard what Richard Tice has had to say there. Are you quaking in your boots? Uh, well, no, I'm not. I mean, he was quite excited this afternoon, Richard, and uh, uh, that's often his way. Uh, but, you know, we have seen challenger parties in the past. And, you know, you could argue that UKIP and the Brexit Party were helpful in getting the Conservative in, Conservatives into a better place to make sure that we actually did follow through on the referendum and got the job done under, under Boris Johnson. I had expected that uh, challenger parties of the right had been put in the tomb, the, the coffin sealed, not to be seen again. But we have to accept that when there is a big issue, and the migrant issue is now in, in the top few issues that I think we're all MPs are facing in their email inbox, uh, you know, the, the potential is that that vacuum can be filled uh, in a short term by somebody else. Now, uh, that's all very well, but they would face just the same difficulties as we're facing as a Conservative government in solving the problem. So, but, but the threat is there. Obviously, it is. It's not a threat I want. I want us, the Conservative Party, to finally solve this issue. Now, it's a, you know, a multifarious problem. We, we know that. It's, there's no easy answers. There's no pack, back of a fag packet to put it right. Yeah. And the new thing that's, that's hit us this year is the Albanian dimension, which 
frankly, I do not understand. There is no logic to it. How an Absolutely. EU African country, NATO country, member of the Council of Europe, and all the rest of it, and uh, refuse. Uh, there is no application, as far as I'm aware, that is accepted for refugee status in both Germany and Sweden. So how come we're having a different interpretation of the same fundamental rules of the 1951 Refugee Convention and the ECHR rules that, that, that have sort of gone, gone since then? It doesn't make sense to it me. It doesn't. How on earth and once again... Once again, it's British taxpayers and it's British voters that are, you know, having the mickey taken out of them. If I, I was about to swear there, Craig, I would never do such a <laughs> thing at this time. But do you reckon, I, I wonder if you'd be able to just set out for voters that might be in Teesside instead of Thanet, what's it actually like in your constituency, which is on the front line of the migrant crisis? What are people in your constituency saying? What's the mood? Because I imagine local authorities are saying, well, hang on a minute, we haven't got the, the infrastructure, we haven't got the resources for this influx of people. Well, we had the you know, Manston uh, processing centre was much in the news this last week, uh, and people moaning about it, saying, oh, you know, the conditions aren't good enough. But honestly, if you have a thousand people land a day, and we had that outrageous uh, bomb attack in Dover just last week as well, which m meant that 700 people were transferred to Manston. Uh, this was a matter of circumstance. It wasn't through design that uh, this place is overloaded. It's a matter of the numbers coming through. Uh, that is obviously a local concern, not quite in my constituency, but just a mile over the border. Uh, but just today, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to say uh, that uh, what was some student accommodation seems to have been acquired by one of the outsourced companies working for the Home Office. And it looks like we will have uh, up to 86 migrants being housed uh, locally in Broadstairs. But uh, it's all very well to be NIMBY. Uh, these people have to go somewhere, but we have caused ourselves a lot of difficulties because we have such a slow system of either approval or rejection of people making a claim. Uh, we are putting people up in, in what many would consider to be quite nice accommodation. Uh, and also, how is it that we have been accepting 76% of all refugee applications where Spain only accepts 11%? Again, under the same rules of the ECHR, refugee conventions. So then there is little wonder why we seem to have pull factors, which makes Britain uh, appear to be a very attractive place. But before I, I you know, we go on with this, Darren, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I do have to blame France, because each and every one of these beach launchings are Fine. from a yeah. beach, usually plus or minus five miles from Calais. And I find it scarcely believable uh, that the French authorities, we've offered them help, we've offered them people, well, yeah, we've offered them as millions need, as well. We've offered them money, we've offered them Craig, the most advanced drones. I want to ask you, I want to ask you, just to finish, because I haven't got long with you, I've got a very patient Arling Foster here. <laughs> I want to ask you very quickly. What do you think about the, the hoo-ha over the use of the word invasion? Would you associate yourself with Suella Braverman's use of that word? I frankly don't care what words are used. I want this solved. I mean, invasion, of course, has connotations from old, but I mean, we use the word invasion in fact. It remember a lot of tourists down from London. So it's become a very, very normal word, and I think it's the word, frankly, that I'm hearing on the street from my constituents, which quite fairly sums up the situation. All right, Craig McKinley MP, we'll leave it there. We're going to go from South Thanet to Northern Ireland. Now, the Northern Irish Secretary has confirmed that there's not going to be an election to force Stormont before Christmas. Chris Heaton-Harris made the remarks after the failure of the Legislative Assembly to agree to restore power sharing at Stormont. The Democratic Unionist Party has stated that until the Northern Irish Protocol is amended or replaced, they will absolutely not have anything to do with any power sharing agreement. Earlier on today, Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill accused the DUP of refusing to return to power sharing at Stormont because an Irish nationalist would be First Minister. Well, joining me to discuss, I can think of no one better, is Northern Ireland's former First Minister, Arlene Foster. Arlene, is this just your former party terrified of the fact that Sinn Féin are going to be First Minister? No, not at all. And actually what Michelle is doing, and Sinn Féin are very good at this, Darren, is whipping up nationalist voters uh, into thinking something which is patently not the case. Uh, I mean, the Assembly, the Executive came apart 
in February of this year. So that's long before Michelle O'Neill uh, won the election and became the largest party. So it's absolutely wrong to say that this is about who's First Minister. And in any event, as you well know, First Minister and Deputy First Minister in Northern Ireland actually hold exactly the mm -hmm. same powers. And actually, the First Minister can't do anything without the consent of the Deputy First Minister and vice versa. So this is all a, a, a big ruse to try and whip up nationalism in Northern Ireland. Actually, of course, what should happen and what needs to happen is that the Northern Ireland Protocol has to be sorted out. Because unless and until unionism and nationalism are content to share power together, and remember that's what the Belfast Agreement is all about, you have to have the consent of unionism yep. and the consent of nationalism. And don't forget as well, Darren, and I think people do forget this, Sinn Féin kept the Assembly from working for three years between 2017 and 2020. That was over, over language. language yeah. legislation. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a bit rich for Michelle O'Neill to talk about democracy and to talk about the need to have government when she didn't allow us to have government for three years. I mean, sadly, I don't have as long with you as I would have liked to, uh, Arlene, but I'm wondering, what would your message be to, to voters in Northern Ireland who are looking at this and they're just saying, for God's sake, we've got so many issues mm, domestically have. in Northern Ireland, as you well know, better than most, where they're saying, I just want this all to be sorted out. Yeah, and that's why both the European Union and the United Kingdom government have a huge responsibility. They signed up to the Northern Ireland Protocol. They have to fix it. We're coming up to the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Agreement, and the Northern Ireland Protocol rips the heart out of the Belfast Agreement. And do they really want to be responsible for the Belfast Agreement being marked on its 25th anniversary with no devolved administration? The EU and the United Kingdom's government really need to come and sort this protocol out. And if the EU refuses, because I, I suspect, Darren, that they're trying to run the clock down exactly. until the next general election. Because they know when... Sir Keir Starmer's going to get in and he's going to say, well, hunky-dory happy days, we're going to hitch our wagon to the EU anyway. Yes, exactly. We'll all go back into the single market. It won't just be Northern Ireland in the single market. It'll be the rest of the United Kingdom as well. So the EU are very good at running down the clock. So... It then comes back to our own sovereign government. What is Rishi Sunak going to do? You've already said he's a huge amount of problems in migration and the economy in general, war in Ukraine. But if he wants to see devolved administration back in Northern Ireland again, he has to sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol so that we can go back to the balance that the Belfast Agreement uh, envisaged when it was signed. Because otherwise, I tell you what, the Belfast Agreement may be coming 25 years that's it. Right? Well, and that's the huge worry because I think what people want to see, want to see, what I want to see as a former first minister, are those devolved administration back working for the people of Northern Ireland in the balanced way that it's supposed to be. Perfect. Arlene Foster, their former first minister of Northern Ireland, and of course GB News presenter. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, I thank you for your time as well for your company. You've been watching Real Britain. Now, this show's on every Saturday. Well, it's going to be on next Saturday at 2 o'clock anyway. But it's Nana Requia next. And now I'm going to leave you with the weather. Well, looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking rather wet, actually, especially across the south and east. Drier, though, with clear spells elsewhere. Let's home in on what detail. So starting in the southwest, rather cloudy, outbreaks of light rain and drizzle across the east of the region, drier further west, where we do have a few cloud breaks developing. A much cloudier picture further east with patchy outbreaks of light rain and drizzle this evening, the rain turning much heavier around London. After a damp afternoon across Wales, conditions will improve as drier conditions arrive from the west, but cloud will linger across high ground. And crossing to the West Midlands, cloud and drizzly outbreaks clearing eastwards, clear spells during the evening, but a bit of mist and fog developing later. The cloud and rain already clearing in the northeast, with mostly dry conditions across the region, but lighter winds and a chance of mist and fog patches as well there. And then looking up to Scotland, then largely dry across Scotland, some cloud lingering across high ground, clear spells and light winds, temperatures dipping into single figures overnight, feeling rather chilly at last for November. And then looking at Northern Ireland, dry, clear spells, a few showers arriving across the very far northwest during the evening as winds pick up a little. So winds picking up then from the west as showers arrive, rain from the south and the east becoming heavier towards dawn. And that's how the weather's shaping up. 
Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage.